In April of 2017, 27-year-old beautician from Poland, Magdalena Żuk, allegedly jumped to her death in Marsa Alam, Egypt. She died just three days into a week-long holiday under suspicious circumstances. Within days, her death will become one of the most mysterious Polish cases, being linked to a range of allegations, from murder to sex trafficking. The questions we need to attempt to answer today, was there ever basis for such claims in her case, and how do we get definitive answers for the family of Magdalena Żuk? Friends and associates, friends, you, you don't even understand how infuriating this case is. I have been researching it for about three or four days now, and I have been fuming, fuming. I discovered this case when I was doing the series on the Lost Girls of Panama. It was on Scarlett's blog, so I watched the videos on it then. I watched the last chapter coverage on this case, and I found the videos extremely haunting to begin with. That's your first trigger warning with this one. The videos that you're about to see, if you're not familiar with this case, are gonna haunt you for a lifetime. So I knew I wanted to take a look into it. Now, what my dumbass has truly fought and hoped for, because if you have listened to the intro, this suspicious death had happened in 2017. I thought I was going into a solved case, and that was apparently dumb of me to presume, because I have never researched a case where I have been more infuriated by the amount of information that is available to the public five years later. Five years later. In April, it will be five years after this case had happened. Quite literally, 90% of the information I'm about to offload onto you today, you need to take with a grain of salt, because it's just online sources. It's not like case files, it's not confirmed, and that has been driving me nuts. That being said, just like with all of the mystery cases I've covered on this channel, I want your Sherlock Holmes caps on. I want you to leave your theories in the comments below once you hear the breakdown of the information. And again, if you have anything that I haven't included here yet, if you're Polish, if you have read a different publication, if you have actually found something that is more legitimate than the information that I found online, let us know down in the comments. I will pin it as usual and just pin all of the information that might be left out of this video. Now, what I want even more, and the main reason why I didn't actually quit researching on this case once I realized the amount of limited information that can actually be corroborated that is available online, is definitive answers. So I will do my best for this video to show in Poland, within Polish representation. I'll try the best with my tags, with the SEO part of it. But I also need your help. If you have any Polish friends, if you have anybody living there, any family that has more access to more publications, that doesn't have the language barrier, and possibly has some legal knowledge as well, to also proactively post the comments on what can the family do here. Because at the end of the day, we are not owed all of the details, but the family deserves to have a conclusion. Magdalena Zhuk's family deserves to know the answers five years after her suspicious death in Egypt. Now, just quickly before we dive into this case, I will be referring to a couple of things in the theories part of this video. One of them is a whole video that I have done before, and it is on this channel, it's on Operation Fort. It is human trafficking, and the whole Operation Fort focuses mostly on trafficking humans for labor. So that is the Polish organization that has trafficked humans to the United Kingdom and had benefited out of it. So here the supposition is that sex trafficking might have occurred. So if you want, I'd suggest probably listening to that one before. I will tell you a bit more about, you know, the information that I got from there that kind of can relate to this case. 
in that part of the video, but just, again, because that case has been confirmed, has been solved, they have sort of proven how that operation had worked. So if you want to compare the two, if you are 100% convinced something like trafficking had happened in this case, I suggest watching that video either before this one or after. But now let me tell you the story of Magdalena Zhuk and anything that I could find online that is available to this date on it. Our story starts in the small city in the southwest of Poland called Bogatinia. This will be where Magdalena will be born on September the 19th, 1990. She would eventually leave this city that only had a population of about 17,000 people. She would leave her family home in order to pursue her dream. This will be once she finished her cosmetic studies at the age of 17 in order to open up a beauty salon in a bigger city of Zgorzelets. At the age of 22, she would open up this salon and she was said to be studying at the same time, doing a bachelor degree in dietetics. And here we have a bit of an insight with this video of Magdalena promoting her own clinic. She was said to be very ambitious, which we can see because she had her clinic open by the age of 22. She was very smart and also super into fitness. All of her social media posts, the videos of her goofing in the car, just showcased that she was leading quite a healthy lifestyle. I mean, it is sort of part of the job as well, but they show the lighter side of Magdalena as well. They show a different, lighter side of somebody who, by all accounts, cared very much about her appearances. It is said that Magdalena was athletic. I mean, we can see it in most of the pictures. She liked to jog and do fitness training in the gym, and she would also train as a pole dancer. So there are some pictures of that. I mean, I would say she is at advanced level in all of these areas, just even based off of the limited amount of pictures that we have from her social media pages. Magda's family would also say that she was quite spontaneous, so the next thing didn't really come as a surprise to anybody. From all accounts, Magdalena was at this point, at the age of 27, living in Wroclaw, which is yet another bigger city in Poland, and here, during a night out, three to four months, we don't know for sure, before her trip to Egypt, she met her now boyfriend, called Marcus. It was said that they met at this nightclub called Grey. Marcus was a hairdresser from Wroclaw. We, again, don't really know much about his childhood and his background. And the two of them are dating, and Magdalena decides out of the blue to surprise him for his birthday. And she decides to book a trip, like an all-inclusive trip, to this Red Sea resort of Marsa Alam. She doesn't tell him this, though, up until about 1 p.m. on the day of departure, which was 25th of August. And, of course, because she doesn't tell him, this is an awkward conversation that they're having now, because Marcus tells Magdalena that his passport has actually expired. There are two versions to this story already. On Scarlett's blog, I have seen a screenshot of the expiry date of Marcus's passport that states it had expired in August of 2016, which means it was in the past. There are versions online without probably people seeing this passport, if this information is correct to begin with, because I'm not sure where this information has been obtained or, like, how did Scarlett get in the possession of this screenshot, but there are other accounts stating that he actually had less than six months. You know how in certain countries you need to have certain amount of months left before you actually travel? Yeah, I didn't know that, so... <laughs> Denmark, you also need six months, just an FYI, because I literally appeared at a passport that kept me for like an hour in the passport control to prove that I have a return trip booked. Well, it's one or the other. I'm inclined to believe it has already expired because of this screenshot. So now Marcus can't go. What he decides to do, though, is probably the weirdest thing that nobody really tackles or tries to explain in this story, so I will pass the baton here to you. He tries to advertise the plane ticket on Facebook, and we have what was said in that Facebook status. 
Four hours before the plane leaves, he posts a ticket announcement on his Facebook page, saying, I'm selling a holiday to Egypt. Departure is today from Katowice, the airport, at 8.20 p.m. The Egypt hotel has four stars and is all in. The value of the trip is 4,000 in Polish currency, which is over 900 euros. I will sell it for half the price for two people. A lot of people will call this Facebook post shady because it's going to start speculations on was this premeditated, did some form of trafficking start from Poland, was Marcus actually aware of this trip and now trying to set this whole alibi thing going. Because it's 2017. There are two individuals that are in their late 20s at this point. What I'm driving at is they should know how the world works. You can't sell a plane ticket. Like, am I insane? I I don't know. You can't sell a plane ticket that would have your passport number on it and your name on it. So Magdalena used this travel agency basically to book this all-inclusive trip and it was called Rainbow Tours. So is it different when it's through a travel agency? Nobody clarifies this online and I just thought, am I going insane? Why is he trying to sell a plane ticket on Facebook? Other rumors on this online are that people actually did get back to Marcus in the DMs, that they actually responded and that he would reply back to them that the tickets have actually been sold. Now, this would be very easy to confirm if it was Facebook, Facebook Messenger, whatever it was online, somebody could have taken screenshots of this. And that I haven't seen online, whether Marcus had actually been lying, saying that the ticket had been sold, which why would he be doing? Why would he be putting it on Facebook in the first place, selling the tickets that he can't sell because they're under his name? And then why would he be telling people that they were sold? Another detail that is under scrutiny here is that there is this whole premise that this trip was spontaneous. But nobody could really say for sure how Magdalena got the money to pay for it. Because, as mentioned, the value of the trip is just about under a thousand euros. Some sources would state that the parents borrowed Magdalena this money. However, then other sources and interviews stated that her dad said that he would never let her go to that country, not alone and not with somebody else either. But then other interviews by her sister state that her sister was aware of her plans to Egypt. So this is just another detail that would be very easy to confirm, just simply taking a look at Magdalena's bank records, but we just aren't privy to those. We don't have that information on the record. And this would be a good time for me to tell you why the information is so convoluted, why every single thing online is then like contradicted in a different source, and why we don't have the receipts, why, unlike in so many cases, I can't actually put it on the screen and then we can see the physical autopsy report, we can then comment on it, or we can have official case files. So, from my research, I'm led to believe that the Polish Prosecution Office had done their investigation. They have interviewed, according to multiple sources, over 200 witnesses. They have looked at the laptops, at all of the records, databases of everybody involved, including Magda, including Marcus, and including everybody else that we're going to speak about. They have done their investigation between 2017 and today, and there are case files on it. However, the case is still ongoing. Why is it ongoing? Is because they're waiting for the same kind of documents, investigation, video footage, etc. from the Egyptian authorities. So, the case is still not solved because they don't have that part of the puzzle. Now, the family of Magdalena Zhuk cannot speak publicly of this case for legal reasons. From what I've seen, they can actually all land in prison if they were to ever share anything that they know about the case files. So, from my understanding, they have the access to them, they know what has been investigating, and they are basing their own decisions on that information. However, they can't publicly speak about it. 
So taking that into consideration, what you should be taking with a grain of salt is everything that isn't a video that I'm playing here, because that would have a timestamp, we would know that that had happened for sure, or like certain interviews and quotes by the parents that, again, we know have happened. Everything else, you kind of have to wonder how that information is on the internet. Either somebody had leaked it, whether that person has leaked it in connection to the family, whether it was somebody from them, like, you know, starting a rumor, like, discussing it with other family members, and then somebody else leaked it, which I don't blame them if that is what happened, or it is somebody close to the prosecution's office, or it is somebody from Egypt. So... That is one option. The other option is that it is complete speculation. Just bear that in mind, because I've covered the case of Lost Girls of Panama, and there I knew that the comments were mostly really strong, passionate theories that were based off of the speculation that has circulated the internet here. And that's not really the kind of information that we need. I will still state what I found online, but, you know, know your sources and question your sources when making your decisions on this case, is all I'm saying. Now, getting from that tangent that I went on telling you which information you should be trusting and which you shouldn't, Magda here decides there's no time to find an alternative to get somebody else to buy this trip or to go with her. She can't replace the name on the ticket. And also, she can't have it refunded, so she decides to take this trip on her own. Magda that will board that plane at 8.20 p.m. on the 25th of August from Poland to Egypt will be the same one who you've seen in these videos. The one that is determined and hardworking, but also has a playful, relaxed side. According to the Polish journalists from TVP reporting on her family history, she never had any mental health issues. She was never treated psychiatrically herself. She would have some talks with psychologists within a program that is called Adult Children of Alcoholics. So, this program was there to help the youngsters who have grown up with an alcoholic parent. I don't know any further details on this, which parent, which family member, nobody really goes into any further detail, but the important thing here is that Magdalena herself didn't have any issues, rather she was getting some form of therapy for somebody else who had some addiction problems, and the family members would always say that Magdalena was quite healthy, you know, that was her whole lifestyle, also she had the beauty salon, like, it was part of her job as well. She would have never taken drugs on her own, and she was never treated for any sort of psychiatric issues, such as depression. No depression, no anxieties, no psychosis, nothing like that. She was perfectly happy and cheerful, and she was also very excited still to take this trip on her own. So, when it comes to the airport, to her trip that day, there are, again, two versions of events, and we don't have a video recording from this airport. Again, I'm led to believe that the Polish prosecution office does, and they are gonna have their own version. In one version, Marcus, her boyfriend, drops her off at Katowice airport, and Magda is kind of shedding a couple of tears because she won't see him for a few days, and, you know, this was supposed to be their mutual trip. The private detective office that looked at this case, that is based in Poland, called Lampert Office, can confirm this. So, apparently, at the airport, Magdalena was crying, but, according to the witnesses, she doesn't otherwise behave strangely. She wouldn't have been allowed onto the flight had she been acting in any suspicious way, but a lot of people, witnesses from this part of her journey, will say at the airport she acted completely normal, during the flight, you know, she was still, like, completely cheerful, normal. There was no odd behavior from Magda whatsoever. According to the articles, though, the official police information has a different account. TVP journalists say that there is a video of this, but the prosecutor's office has not made a decision to make that recording public. So, the only recordings that I will be overlaying here are of the airport in itself. 
Whichever story is correct here, Magdalena Zhuk will board her flight for 8.20 p.m. on the 25th of April, and she will be flying to Urgada in Egypt. Urgada won't be the place where she will be staying at. She has booked that all-inclusive trip at Three Corners Echinos Resort Beach Hotel in a city called Marsa Alam. This is a seaside town that is about 286 kilometers away from Urgada. So what isn't clear here, some sources say that she had rented a car and then drove herself from the airport. Some say she had been picked up. And we don't have that leg of the trip. We don't have any footage at the airport in Urgada. Editing Maya here, just real quick, as I haven't mentioned this yesterday. So the flight to Urgada would last the same amount of time as the flight to Varsala, roughly four hours if it's a direct flight, which we think it was here. However, now, if she was to fly to Urgada, a lot of people point out, well, then the car journey to Marsalam to the resort would have taken three hours. So why would she, instead of flying directly to the airport, choose this route? Is it suspicious? Possibly yes, but we also have to think that the tour agency has probably booked this flight on her behalf. So just a note here, as I forgot to mention it yesterday. Let's go back into the normal looking Maya. On Marsa Alam, the seaside town where Magda had booked her holiday, just like with the rest of the story, there's differing information. So there is information that this is pretty much a place where families go to retire, that there is no real nightlife to speak of, and that it is an unlikely sex tourism destination. But even at the first glance online, this city does belong on plenty of lists. Ten must-visit beaches in Egypt. 10 must-visit places there. It is known for its sandy beaches and called the Egyptian Maldives. So what we know for sure is that this is a coastal city, meaning that it will heavily rely on tourism. And here, somebody wrote to Scarlett for the Cold Case blog, and she had shared some insightful information on there about who this kind of place would employ and why they are so focused on tourism. And I thought of including that because it will become relevant as we go along in the timeline of this story. So according to this person, who apparently is Egyptian and understands sort of how things work there, there is a general mechanism in a place when it comes to the people who would have worked in Marsalam or Ugada. According to them, 90% of the people working in those places would be low-class citizens, who would come mostly from smaller cities and who wouldn't be having the highest education. They would live day by day, often wouldn't have any bank accounts or savings, but what is important here is their relationship with local police. Only about 150,000 citizens live in the Red Sea area, compared to bigger cities like Cairo with about 30 million inhabitants. So police keep good track record of the workers who flock to the Red Sea because of tourism, because it's vital, it's the highest priority there. What this means, according to this correspondent of Scarlet's, the criminal records of workers are checked by police when they arrive, and care is taken that nothing disturbs the flow of tourism. What they were getting at is that a tour guide or anybody treated as a resident, anybody working with tourists directly, would never, in a million years, be on his own. Whether they were securing Magdalena's travel to Urgada or had anything to do with her death, they would not have acted on their own. And I can already see you angrily typing, this is just like with the girls of Panama. Because in this case... I believe a lot of people would go either one extreme or the other. Either you will think there's no foul play, or you will think every single person is in on it. According to this person, tourists and foreigners have a high status in Urgada. They are protected even more than Egyptian citizens themselves sometimes. Untouchable, again, because of tourism. So one complaint that they can give can end somebody's career in tourism industry. 
This information will soon become relevant as we speak about Magda's first day in Mar Salam. So, Wednesday, 26th of April, this is still during that same night. So, she landed in Urgada and then somehow made it to the resort. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, she rings Marcus. Marcus would say that this was a phone call from her sounding panicked, saying that somebody was in her room and that she is hearing voices in her room. So, she asks him to talk to the staff at the front desk of the hotel to check what's going on around her room and then she hands the phone over to a receptionist. Marcus talks to this receptionist and asks him to check if everything is okay in Magdalena's room and Magda would later say that she was fine. So, this night ends with Magda apparently being fine. That receptionist checked her room, told her everything was okay and we are supposed to believe she went to sleep. Next morning, she wakes up and she's just enjoying her all-inclusive holiday. The other guests at the hotel would state that Magda seemed to be enjoying herself. She was drinking large quantities of alcohol, but that was understandable because it was all-inclusive. She was getting them for free. What those guests wouldn't see are the messages that Magda allegedly started sending to her friends and to Marcus. It seemed like she was increasingly getting panicked. And she was also chatting to them as if they were there, like asking them, where are you? Where is Marcus? When are we meeting up? And then asking the hotel staff, like, oh, you know, is my boyfriend here? Like, we're supposed to meet. And everybody just found it super strange. Again, no screenshots that I can provide here about those texts because they belong to the case file. As the day progresses, Magdalena is said to have started pleading with Marcus to come to Egypt to pick her up. And also her friends at some point couldn't even reach her through her own phone. She started using somebody else's phone. This guy's name is Mahmoud Khairi and he is said to be the resident, so like a travel agent of sorts that works for that hotel and is there to help tourists when needed. And from this point on, Magda's phone would be sporadically switched on and off, but most of the communication will be made through Mahmoud's phone. Her friend from Poland would report on the conversation that she had with Magda this first day. According to her, Magda said someone had probably spiked her drink with something. She spoke very strangely, she almost mumbled, it was hard to get contact with her. The staff at the hotel would also witness the erratic behavior. Rather, they would say that there were two completely different sides. So, either Magda was just sitting in a corner, sipping on her drink, completely calm, or she would behave in this erratic way. She would be, like, really lively, wanting to organize a party with all of the other Polish guests, or she would get aggressive and wouldn't accept the help of anybody at that hotel. Because of this behavior and because some of the hotel guests then started reporting on Magda behaving oddly, they decide to call the Rainbow Tours, the agency that booked her on that trip, and there she speaks to somebody, she speaks to their representative, and at some point Magda just refuses to continue that conversation, refuses to speak with them again. The last information that we have from this first day is that the family of Magdalena's gets looped in. Somebody reports of this behavior that she's displaying in the hotel to the family and they get really worried and they want to send somebody over, basically, to see what's going on and then to take her home. However, it seems like all of them are in the similar situation that Marcus was. Either their passports have expired or they don't have enough months on them. So, they sort of put this on Marcus to find somebody, like a friend of theirs, to actually send over to Magda. So, the next day, 27th of April, comes along and Magda is still behaving in a very erratic way. She would end up having a call with her sister and her sister would state how Magda was incoherent and not speaking sense and this would further alarm the family and this is when they contacted both the travel agents and the Polish embassy in hope of some sort of help just to get Magdalena home safely. She would still behave erratically throughout that resort, according to all of the reports. She would either be shouting down her phone in the lobby, just making wild arm movements. 
And according to a couple of guests, they would see her running around the hotel in long trousers. And then suddenly starting to take her clothes off. So the blouse just showing her bare breasts to the hotel. On the other side of that, her family was still getting odd text messages. Asking them, where are you? Come to me. And these messages are now sent from Mahmoud Kairi's phone. As Mahmoud is now taking care of Magda, as is the hotel staff, Marcus, who was charged to find somebody to go to Egypt, as Magda seemed to be in a state where she was unable to fly, does two things, according to the sources. One is book a flight for their mutual friend, this guy called Marcek, to actually fly over to help Magda. But now, because the flights didn't happen every single day, he books that flight on a Saturday. And then he, from what I gathered, booked the flight on Saturday for Magda to also return to Poland. So to, to fly back a bit earlier than expected because she was supposed to stay there for a week. Now, I'm not sure how that would have looked like. I was thinking about this. Would this guy Marcek sort of get out of his flight, you know, to the arrivals area and then go to the departures to fly back directly? with Magda, like, what was the plan there? Was there only, like, one flight per day? But this was set up as a plan. There are reports here that either there were no flights or there were no seats on the flights until Saturday. I'm kind of inclined, based on the information that I see, meaning there are flights every day between these two countries, that it's probably that there were no seats on any flights until that day. With this flight back being booked and Magda only having to wait until Saturday to fly back, you would think that information would have calmed her down. But the rest of this second day is pretty much left to just speculation. According to one version of the events, people at the hotel have offered to call for a doctor, to call for help, because multiple witnesses have reported that Magda is in constant state of distress, that she's just often crying and just displaying behavior that she never displayed back in Poland. And then, according to other sources, Mahmoud is now taking care of her, and he is the person that actually offered to call for a doctor, to call for the embassy, like, he's in charge of everything. The official version here is that Magda has been refusing help throughout this whole journey, you know, with the rainbow tours, then now when they suggest calling a doctor, calling somebody, having her checked up at a hospital, she is the one that is refusing help. But something that we don't see and isn't put any emphasis on in this story is, is she eating? Is she sleeping? Is anybody else staying with her in her room? And why? Like, we never have the end of day here. Or rather, even the beginning of the day. Here we have the pictures and the videos, which aren't really timestamped online, so they happen at some period during this or the next day. And apparently Mahmoud is the one taking these pictures. And in one of them, she's covering her face with a towel while she's lying in bed. And I'm just wondering again, what is the context here? But you kind of see like a plate full of food behind her, which makes me believe that she hasn't been touching any food. Witnesses have stated she hasn't been sitting down for meals. So has she even eaten since she got to Egypt? And then has she been sleeping? Has anybody else had access to her room? Are all of the questions we just don't know the answers to. Then there's this video and pictures, because the video is quite static in a way, of Magda just sort of collapsed in front of the door to her room, just on the ground with her face covered. And again, you have to worry about the context here. It seems to me like she's in the same robe as she was in the previous picture. So are these just taken, you know, during the same time frame, kind of like minutes apart, hours apart? We just don't know. And from what I could find, those are the only two pictures, rather one video, one picture, that Mahmoud has taken. So why not take more? Because we don't have any hotel footage. We don't even know if the Egyptian authorities have any hotel footage to prove or disprove any of this information, to show us whether Magda has been going to her room on her own or not. 
but I'm just wondering why have these two pictures been taken only? If he is the one monitoring her state, if she is using his phone for whatever reason while her phone is operating perfectly fine, why only monitor in this seemingly similar time frame where she's wearing the same clothes? If not, maybe trying to, again, either provide an alibi for yourself, some sort of cover, saying that you have been on top of things when you haven't. The way this second day of Magda's trip will end is also cause for much speculation. So, in the evening, it is said that Magdalena went to the beach. And from there, people are speculating that she has been transported to a small ship and this is where she spent the night. So, Magda's cell phone, her own phone, was on during this time, and later, once they inspected her phone, the location would show that she is literally in the middle of the sea. I'm gonna put the pictures up. These are from Scarlett's blog. I'm not sure where exactly Scarlett got them from, but here it is seen that she is about 20 kilometers offshore in the Red Sea. Most of the articles that Scarlett combined on the Cold Case blog have the links to YouTube videos that are now unavailable, but most of them refer to that private investigation group from Poland, Lampard Group, so I suppose this is their investigation. I don't know how they got a hang of Magdalena's records and everything that the prosecution office is officially looking at, so just something, again, to take with a grain of salt. But this puts a whole story in place. According to the spokesperson for the Polish prosecution office, they would say, we have not confirmed that this had happened, that Magda was at sea. Her phone was then logged into BTS station that covered the range of the hotel she was registered in. I have never seen their versions of these pictures, just by the way, but a private investigation group called Lampard would say that the prosecutor's office had admitted a fact that was later revealed through the autopsy reports, that Magdalena was wearing clothes on which, as a result of forensic examinations, biological traces of at least a few unidentified people were discovered. And then it says in brackets, think of substances like sperm here. There is one single article on this that is included in Scarlett's blog that I could find, no official autopsy report, so either you believe that something has been put in place here, whether it was organized from Poland or whether all of the bad guys are based in Egypt, that somebody drugged Magda or just lured her onto this boat, and that then some form of sexual assault or rape had happened there. This theory of foul play makes sense for so many people because we pick up on Friday 28th of April. And here, the family actually can't reach Magda for the whole morning from what I've seen, and she doesn't answer her calls, and eventually, during the course of the day, they managed to tell her on the phone that a plane ticket had been arranged for her to come home the next day, so she just has to wait for about 24 hours or less at this point, and she will be flying home. But this is when the footage of Magda lying on the floor, curled up, covering her face with that bathrobe, will be sent to the family. So, from my resources, the staff of the hotel sent this footage, and it wasn't made by Mahmoud. I'm not sure who this was made by. Is it from the official hotel cameras? But they sent it to the family. And at this point, the family got extremely concerned, which I ask once again, why would you only send this footage now? But for people who believe that foul play had taken place now, connecting the dots, that would mean that she is in such a state of shock and just disbelief because something happened on a boat the night before, that maybe she's getting blackmailed for now, maybe somebody recorded something, or maybe she's just in a depressive state because of being sexually assaulted or raped. 
But due to this, the staff of the hotel sharing this now with the family, the family getting extremely concerned, they ask for Magda to be taken into a hospital, to be examined. And here, around 3 p.m., Magda is taken to a hospital in Port Galib. We finally have the actual footage here, and the head of the hospital, Dr. Ahmed Shauki, would state that Magda couldn't even get out of the ambulance car. However, in the footage we see her getting out on her own. They even came out with a wheelchair, but she just walks in by herself. She is something that I noticed in most of these videos, going back and forth. There is the footage from the parking lot here, where she just seems to be just walking back and forth. It's as if there is a pattern to it, but in this footage, as she walks into the hospital, she's the calmest that you will see her out of all of the footage that is available out there. Also, let me know what you see from this footage outside in the parking lot, because I think she's on the phone here. It is kind of grainy and she is far away. And make a note of a guy in the checkers shirt, because he will appear. So she's constantly accompanied by people and we never learn their names. We never know who they are. Are they Mahmoud and somebody else? Why is there so many people accompanying her? Do they belong to hotel staff, travel agencies? Because it is easy to see who are the doctors and nurses and then the people that are just accompanying her. So here she just walks into a room. We don't really know what happens here, but she is released from this hospital. It is said that during this hospital visit, Magda wasn't treated. And there are reports stating that this is because the hospital didn't have a psychiatric unit, like they didn't deal with mental health patients. But others state that Magda refused to be treated which can either by this point appear as a pattern, like Magda refusing help at all costs, at all times, or it can appear as a narrative, as somebody else telling us that Magda is refusing all of this while they're just not giving her any help, while pretending that they are. They gave her a medication called midazolam, so midazolam is used before a procedure, before somebody was to undergo an operation. So it is there to induce sleepiness or drowsiness and relieve anxiety before surgery. The effects of it are that it can slow down or stop your breathing, especially if you have recently used an opioid medication or alcohol. And it should only be used in hospital, dentist office or another clinic setting. After taking it, the person would feel drowsy for at least 24 to 48 hours. And this dizziness or drowsiness can cause falls, accidents, or severe injuries. Common side effects are amnesia or forgetfulness after your procedure, drowsiness, nausea or vomiting, and blurred vision. Now, the report you are seeing on the screen, again, is from Scarlett's blog. I don't know if it is official, if it is not. However, it has some inconsistencies. If you are looking at this report, they have stated that her history is of agitation, irritability, disorientation since four days. But we know it hasn't been four days at this point. It has been two, two and a half at best, if we are pushing it. And also the diagnosis states acute psychosis, which if you don't have a psychiatric unit, I'm just wondering how are we determining this? How do we suddenly know, even though we don't treat mental health issues, what to diagnose her with? We have no idea here what Magda does with the rest of her day. However, something that isn't emphasized here is, you know, the next day she is flying home. She should be calm at this point. And a lot of people will see, you know, holes in that story as to, well, the reasons why she's not calm is probably because she is on some sort of drugs, she has gone through some sort of stress, whether it is on that ship or in her room, for all we know. We have no footage of what's going on in this hotel. But I'm trying to point this out because at this point you can see it from Magda's point of view. You know, she now knows she will be traveling home. They have told her, so she knows within 24 hours she will be back to safety. 
or you can see it from a point of view of anybody trying to do Magda harm, knowing that now they have only 24 hours to somehow make sure that she doesn't speak of what had happened to her. Having that in mind, we pick up early on a Saturday morning, 29th of April. So this is the day she was supposed to be flying back. However, according to independent investigators, please take it with a grain of salt, around 6 a.m. hotel staff prevented Magda from jumping off the roof of the hotel. This report, according to this article, will be given from the travel agency, saying, on the night of April the 28th, the hotel security staff observed that Mrs. Magdalena left her room and went to the roof of the building. The accounts of the facility staff told us that she was trying to get closer to the edge of the roof and the employees brought her back to her room. This is where Magdalena would have stayed alone until Saturday morning, when she was brought to the airport by Mahmoud and friends. As I can't corroborate this in any other way, I have done what I haven't seen done before, which is look up what this roof looks like, to even try to see if there's any credibility to it. And it is easily accessible. I found this YouTube video that I will be playing here, and, you know, the comment also confirms that this is the roof of that hotel, so, basically, you can access it, apparently, through the stairs, so all of the floors probably have the access to it. If you just climb to the highest floor, you can get out, and then you can see they get back in, and you can just see the doors of the rooms. So I'm not sure if this area was shut, closed, locked during the night, but could it have happened? Yes. Do we know for sure? No. Another thing we don't know for sure is this next bit. Has Magdalena actually been driven to the airport? Because we don't have the footage from there either. I made a few other notes when it comes to the hotel thing that just stand out to me and can prove whether or not this is credible. Like, if the hotel staff were in charge of sending the footage of Magdalena collapsed on the floor before to her family, and they have known that Magdalena was on the roof, that would mean that they have known this because somebody, you know, the security guard, whatever, uh, was observing, you know, the night person was looking at the hotel footage and they have spotted somebody heading to the roof and they were like, oh my god, this is Magdalena, you know, we have had issues with her behaving erratically around the hotel, let's go and prevent her from jumping. So that means that footage existed, uh, at least at that point, so... Why not, again, if we are having the record of behavior, send it to her family? Because she is leaving now, you have technically saved somebody's life, if this is correct. But the second bit that I noted here is if they have returned her to the room, which is where she stayed alone, that kind of means that nobody was really staying with her. She wasn't under the rest, at least, during the nights. And then one last note here is something that you will notice from this point on in the video is the need to escape that Magda is displaying. As you will, you know, see the videos and stuff, she always looks like she is looking to escape out of any situation. And this is how, unfortunately, she will succumb to her death as well. So whichever way you see this, you can see how... Again, if this had happened, Magda herself might have actually wanted to run out of the situation, whether it was because of a psychotic break or because something happened to her and she was ashamed of it and she didn't even want to return home to live with that shame any longer. As I mentioned, Mahmoud and his friends, whoever these friends were, were to take her to the airport. But Magda's flight wasn't until that afternoon. So here we have a gap between 6 in the morning, apparently if this had ever happened, and 2 p.m. And then, at 2 p.m., apparently Magda checks out of the hotel. Here, at the airport, different reports would state that Magda wouldn't be allowed on the plane, for different reasons. It is claimed that the airport doctor examined her and didn't give her permission to travel. And then the travel agency where she booked her trip would declare that it was cockpit staff, air crew, 
who decided that they wouldn't allow Magdalena on board. There's an article even claiming that the plane's pilot saw how Magda was behaving strangely, then called the airport doctor to assess her medical state, and then they advised them not to take her on board. Again, regardless of which way this happened, she would not be allowed on this flight. I personally don't believe that it was pilots and air crew. They are not the ones that are supposed to make this decision. And also because that would mean that they made that decision the only logical way would be once she was to have already made it to the plane. And by that point, Mahmoud, whoever would have already left that airport, would have been gone. But we know that they weren't because at this point, the virtual Poland representative would inform the tour operator who booked Magdalena her holiday that she didn't get on this flight, and from the airport she is then driven back to that hotel. Again, different sources state different things, like kill me now with this case. Some state she was driven back to the same hotel, they tried to check her back in, but this hotel wouldn't even accept it, even though technically it was still paid for. Not sure how that works because of all of the hassle that she has already caused them. So now Mahmoud and his friends are basically driving her around from hotel to hotel trying to place her somewhere before the friend makes it to Egypt and then, you know, they're gonna decide this friend, Maciek and her. A couple of notes on this part of the story that I have made here is if this was her potential point of escape, if this was the point where she could have actually gotten to freedom, why not seek help from somebody else? If she was allowed by these people, by Mahmoud, by anybody here to actually go and check in, to go beyond the gates, why not do it? Why not go towards safety? Why not escape or even alert somebody that you are in danger? We don't have any footage here however. And this is the part where I mostly am concerned about, because who drove her there? Can we really trust any sources about this leg of her journey? Was she even driven to the airport, for all we know? Because we don't have anything confirmed in any form of receipts, timestamps, video footage that we can see. And that I find super concerning. Back in real time, Magda will either have returned now to the first hotel, and this call would be made from the car park from there, or it is said in other sources that they have actually checked three different hotels, that the third one accepted her, so that this call was made from a parking lot from that hotel. This is a 14 minute long call, so of course I won't play all of it, I will just play certain highlights, and it is made around 5 p.m. So Magda will call her boyfriend Marcus. And Marcus, on one end, in Poland, is recording this call, and on the other end, the call is made from Mahmoud's phone. So the camera is facing Magda, but you can see that she is using both of her hands, so he is holding it and he is talking to somebody else in the background at that parking lot. This call will haunt you for a lifetime, and about 95% of it is just Marcus trying to calm Magda down, telling her not to be scared, asking her to tell him what's going on, and also her just being anxious, going back and forth, putting the hands on top of her head, just not really revealing much. Let us dissect certain parts of this call. In the first about 30 seconds, you can hear people speaking in what is Egyptian dialect, so I think they're speaking Arabic, in the background, and we have no idea who these people are, and then you can hear Marcus trying to calm Magda down. So let's see what they're saying, and then something interesting happens. During the time that you can hear the chatter from the background while Magda is still anxious and not really revealing much, and that is that Marcus gets a call that he rejects, and this call is by a guy with a nickname Zloty, meaning golden. So we'll speak about him further down the line, but just after watching it, tell me in the comments what you're observing. Nie bój się, powiedz mi, co się dzieje. Powiedz mi, nic się nie bój. 
Maciek cię zabierze. Dobrze? Rozumiesz? W skarbie, słuchasz mnie? W skarbie, słyszysz mnie? Myszko, rozumiesz mnie? Pamiętasz, pamiętasz Maćka Solczaka? Tego z brodą? Myszko, pamiętasz Maćka Solczaka? Pamiętasz go? Tego z brodą? To on po ciebie przyjedzie. On będzie po ciebie rano. Dobrze? I Ma Maciek się będzie tobą opiekował. Nic się tobie nie stanie. Her boyfriend is trying to calm her down, telling her that a friend is coming over. But then the more alarming parts of the call come across. So, as I mentioned, most of it is him trying to get anything out of her, but just kind of repeating the exact same thing, like, what had happened, trust me, you know, you can tell me everything. Not really, like, digging or asking any more persuasive questions. And at some point, people say that they have read from her lips as if, like, Magda said this with closed lips, but that she said, I've been raped. And a comment on that video stated, I'm Polish and she has said I was raped, and the person in the background has said, don't take that out of her. That's charged us. Kochanie, powiedz. Myszko, mów, co się dzieje. Powiedz mi, myszeczko. Ktoś ci coś tam zrobił? Tak? Kochanie, ja jutro po ciebie będę... Będzie jutro po ciebie Maciek, tylko mi powiedz, co się stało? Co się stało? Kochanie, powiedz mi. Powiedz mi. Zabiorę cię. Kochanie, czy ktoś ci zrobił krzywdę tam? Powiedz mi. Musisz mi powiedzieć. After prompting her some more, Magda says it won't do anything. They'll take me to the hotels. And then it seems like he interrupts her, like he jumps into the conversation. And after this again, he's saying, just tell me, tell me what happened. Did anybody harm you there? And she just says, take me away from here. Kochanie, ja jutro po ciebie ben... będzie jutro po ciebie Maciek, tylko mi powiedz, co się stało. While Marcus is still trying to get information from Magda, saying, don't be scared, tell me, the background voice, you can hear, states he doubts he's gonna do anything because his dick is so small. So, according to people believing in foul play here, this conversation was made because Marcus asked Mahmoud. He was afraid because something went wrong and then she remembered what they have done. So, she was about to rat them out and Marcus wanted to have an alibi. And that's why they're saying that he had a small dick. Garbie, nie bój się. Mów do mnie, nie bój się. Możesz mówić, śmiało, mów do mnie. Myszko, nie bój się, powiedz mi. The main reason why this is one of the hardest videos to watch is because Magda apologizes so many times and she just keeps repeating. It won't help. Either she's saying they'll take me to the hotels or she's just saying it won't help, I can't say. I'm sorry, it's just so heartbreaking to watch. Once you watch like 14 minutes, 10 times, it's just, I don't even know what to make out of it. She's clearly in a state of panic and she can't speak because they are there. Słucham? Wrócisz stąd. Wrócisz. Kochanie, co się stało? Powiedz mi, co się stało? Musisz powiedzieć mi, skarbie, proszę cię. Ale powiedz mi, co, powiedz mi, ja to muszę wiedzieć. 
She's even telling him, go back to work because I won't be coming back from here. And then she says the letter M. And he tries to get more information. M what? M who? Like, there's so many people in this story whose name starts with M. But she just doesn't say anything. To powiedz szybko, teraz. M. Co M? Co M? Ten rezydent? Tak? Myszko, powiedz. Tak? The call ends with about a millionth time of Marcus asking Magda to tell him what happened and then Mahmoud takes the phone from Magda. He says something about Polish embassy and that Magda should switch her phone on because Marcus tells him, like, can she just make sure her phone is switched on? And the call ends with Marcus hanging up and saying there is something there. I'll put the full length of this call in the description if you want to listen to it. I mean, everything that I haven't included here pretty much is just him asking her to tell him something. And you sort of hear the background voices just laughing or talking about small dicks, which leads me to my first question. Why? If for 14 minutes this woman has been erratic on a phone call and you know that she has been displaying this behavior before, whoever the hell you are, Mahmoud at least knows, and he is the one probably holding that phone, the question is why? Let me know what you think about the call down below, the notes that I have put here, is why is this the conversation that they're having? And this goes both ways. Why is it recorded by Marcus? And then why isn't she the one holding the camera? Why is it somebody else? Why don't we know who is surrounding her? Where is Marcus even during the recording? It seems like he's in a pitch darkness, like he has tried really hard not to display his face. There's a point in the call where it looks like he's even trying to block the screen with his thumb. People are saying he doesn't sound upset, like this phone is clearly staged. And he will say later that this phone call was actually accidentally made public. We don't really know when, it would definitely happen sometime in 2017, but how was it accidentally made public if you recorded it on purpose? This is the same Marcus who tried to sell his plane tickets on freaking Facebook, okay? I'm not putting anything past him, but like, really, really, like you don't understand technology. It was accidentally uploaded to a place, sure. I found an article on this and from that article, Marcus's colleague, called Michal, was the one who recorded that video. And he told the reporter that it was his idea to start recording the conversation because Magdalena was making some comments that made him think it was better to record it. Apparently, her behavior forced our subconscious to record it. This is not conversation that has been recorded right from the beginning. Marcus then explained that it was accidentally made public. He also said that he was planning to marry Magda in the US in October of 2017. This is all stated like line after line. I'm not sure if this is the same interview, if this is the course of how it went, where he followed one thing with the other, and in which case, again, why? He explained that he stayed calm because, did you see in which state Magda was? If I screamed and got upset, would it have helped her? No, I had to stay calm. Last couple of notes that I have made here on this call is the supposition here 
is that all of these people are working together. Michal, the guy that recorded the call. Marcus, the boyfriend. Zloty, who is the one that called within the first 60 seconds of recording, and Marcus rejected his call. And then, of course, Mahmoud, at least, that we know of in Egypt. That this was organized, this was sex trafficking, and they have transported her to Poland. That is one of the theories. And people who believe in it believe this has all been set up by them. To which then my question is, why why did Mahmoud show his face, A? Why do we have the record of Zloty being associated with Marcus on camera? They could have cut that thing out. This is 2017. There was technology to make this video shorter or to start recording afterwards or to just tell this person, don't call me during this phone call. Why do we know who was the person that is recording it? If you are trying to set this as some sort of alibi, a worried boyfriend who just wants his girlfriend back, then why basically show everybody else who is involved in this operation, who is in on it? I'm saying that because most of the comments on this call are along the lines of she's clearly in fear of her life and her boyfriend is calm, so he probably sold her. Like, variations on the team. And to you, I just wonder what your explanation is for literally everybody showing up their face. Like, this could have been done in a lot smoother way. Why was Mahmoud the person there who was following her? Why did everybody know that he was technically looking after her? If he had already spiked her drink, if she was already drugged, he didn't have to associate himself with her to do anything, really. If we are thinking that this was just rape or sexual assault, or even if we think this is organized crime, why are any of these people showing their faces, their names? It just doesn't seem necessary. It just doesn't really click for me. So you let me know what you think down below. But something <laughs> that not a single article, regardless of the language, mentions, it is that Mahmoud is fluent in Polish. Why is Mahmoud fluent in Polish? If he is from Egypt, if he is of Arabic descent, is it for his job? It's never clarified. And everybody's just like, oh yeah, Mahmoud is just there, fluent, completely fluent in Polish. And like, I understand this is not a priority here in terms of like the question that Marcus would ask at some point. But at some point you would ask if this is the person taking care of your family, like, how come that you, my man, are completely fluent in this language? Yes, it could be because he works for a travel agency, but somebody should have probably questioned that as well. After this call, as we have heard during it from the background noises, they plan to bring her to a hospital. So this is when the second hospital trip would take place. And Magdalena's parents would hear of this and they would finally be calm, thinking she's safe, she's gonna be taken care of. However, here there's also a gap in time. The timestamp on the hospital footage that we see is 1858. And it's a completely different situation here. Magda is not walking on her own. She is actually in a wheelchair going into this hospital. And then... There are recordings of people moving freely. There's a whole hour of just, like, recordings of the guy in the tracker shirt, somebody else, so many men that shouldn't belong there, that aren't hospital staff, just walking freely in a waiting room around the hospital. Between this point and about 10-11 minutes after midnight, we lose track of Magda. We are probably to believe that she is inside of the room. And then, in one of the most disturbing videos, shot in the hallway of that hospital, Magda seems to be fleeing away from that room. She then is being held by a group of people, some of them we think is hospital staff, there's a nurse, and then possibly a doctor, but most of them are, again, not wearing scrubs, not wearing any clothes that are to make me believe that they are hospital personnel and that they should be there. Why are they waiting? If she is there to be given, I don't know, tranquilizer, stay overnight, why are they still there? 
the number of people changes in these different shots, but there's a couple of main people here. So at some point, at least four men and one woman are chasing and encircling her. She falls onto the ground here and at some point then just gets up, but she is showing all of the rage to this guy standing by the blinds. She's throwing herself at him, at the guy in the checkered shirt, clearly focused on him. Then she kind of falls onto the right side of our camera shot and there is another man who is very clearly trying to shield us from seeing whatever Magda is doing. He clearly knows where the camera is and is trying to hide something from us, just because of this weird position that he is in. Once Magda gets up, it seems like, again, all of her anger is towards the guy in the checkered shirt, but here she draws the blinds down. And you can see this nurse and other staff, other personnel, and also other men, again, tackling her, speaking with her, we don't know because of the sound. But then this nurse finds it to be her priority to go towards the blinds and to actually pull them down instead of, like, lifting them up. Now, this man that has been trying to hide this camera view, and literally everybody that isn't, again, personnel, that isn't staff of the hospital that should be dealing with this, is tackling Magda to the ground. And there's always somebody in the view of the camera, whether it is the nurse, the guy in a white shirt, there's always somebody trying to prevent us from seeing things. Now, Magda is on the floor, we have no idea if she's conscious or not at some point, and at least four of these men grab her by the hand or the leg and they carry her out somewhere, possibly into a room. So some notes I've made here. One is on the blue shirt guy, the guy trying to hide the camera from us. The only innocent reason, quote-unquote, that I could think of in this moment, even though it does last only for a few seconds, is that Magda might have been trying to take her clothes again, expose herself. If we are to trust the witness testimonies from the guests at the hotel, maybe that's why. The other reasons are all more sinister, and something I would probably agree with more is that maybe nobody can read her lips, maybe they don't know that the audio isn't working and it can't be heard or that nobody can hear what she's trying to indicate, what she's telling to the guy that she's raging at. But my main question here is why does he, and probably other people as well, because everybody's blocking this camera at some point, know where the cameras are in the first place? Is this their first time there? Because it doesn't look it. Because, like, if you are going into a hospital and you are in hospital staff, because, yes, if you are hospital staff, you probably should know where they're at. But if you are going into any establishment, even if you're going into a bank, like, any establishment, you are not immediately, like, checking, like, okay, cameras here, here, and here. Unless you either are a police officer, have experience in this, and just do it by default, or you are trying to commit some sort of crime, like something shady is going on, because why else do you know where the camera is to try to do this weird thing and shield her from whatever she's signaling? Other notes, the blinds, why is this the nurse's priority? Just why? What is in that other room? Is she trying to shield what's happening from somebody else? Maybe there's a logical explanation of her not alarming somebody, maybe it is a patient room, but why? Just why is that a priority? Like, there are men who aren't trained, who aren't hospital staff, tackling Magda on the floor, and you are just there like, I mean, what else can I do? Let me just pull these blinds down. How is that a logical conclusion of what we should be doing here? And then, finally, that last block of the camera, when Magda is on the floor, a lot of people think she might have been knocked out, so that she doesn't say anything, so that she doesn't indicate anything, because she doesn't seem to be mobile or, like, fighting, resisting the way she has once they drag her away. We know of what happens next beyond the camera shots from that nurse. So, apparently, Magda was taken into a private room, and here she would be tied to a bed with towels. So, some people say it's linen, most people say it was just towels, and this is apparently 
usual when it comes to these type of situations. It is not a psychiatric unit, so again, they wouldn't have anything else to restrain her with, but it's also sort of lighter on the skin, it's not really tough on it, so that's why they would have used towels. Apparently, in this room, she will be given sedatives and she was left with two nurses to observe her. But then, witnesses state that after midnight, in the early hours of Sunday, April the 30th now, she will be untied so that she can go to the toilet. And as soon as the nurse untied her, Magdalena was said to have jumped out of the first floor window. Some people will say that this is the second floor, like depending on where you're looking at it, like from the American or British perspective. We don't know the exact height. Again, just like with everything in this case, from this picture that I'm showing you, I think I see two aircon units like on the left, if we are looking at it, so I think this would have been the second floor, but we just never have that information confirmed. So Magdalena jumped out of the window and she landed on the concrete below. The nurse called Fateh Ahmed, who was taking care of her, witnessed this event, and in the interview later she would explain that Magdalena was released from the towels, she grabbed the drip stand and walked with it to the window. She said about it, I was in the room with Magdalena when she jumped out of the window. I tried to stop her, but unfortunately I failed. Magdalena kicked and hit me. I'm very sorry. This is followed by the head of the hospital, Dr. Ahmed Shauki, hearing the bang, and he said he went into the room and he was with his wife at the time, and she was the first one to run down to be with Magda. Magda is now found on the concrete floor below the hospital window. She is in a bad condition. She has had severe injuries due to this fall, but even though she has had extensive injuries to her face, head, chest, arms, and legs, she is still alive at this moment. Now, let's talk about two different versions of where Magda was found. So, from the beginning, Magda's family was told that Magda fell on the stairs below the window. So, if you're looking at this picture, this to me would indicate a jump. Because these stairs are positioned about 2 to 2.5 meters away from the wall. Now, in 2019, the parents will travel to Egypt again, they will go to this hospital. And the nurse here was the same nurse, she was supposed to lead them to the place but she showed the family a different spot. It was more than two meters away from the stairs. So this would contradict the official version that was given to them by the Egyptian officials. In nurses' opinion, Magda had been laying below the wall, with her head under one of those aircon units. After this fall, Magda would have to be transported to a different hospital to be treated for her injuries, and here we have one last medical report that was again found on the cold case blog by Scarlett, and it is from Port Galib Hospital. Uh, from what I can see, again, I agree with most people's opinions here, that it just seemed like they copy-pasted, you know, the history, the agitation, irritability, disorientation from the first report. Something that I found interesting is her temperature. Here it is measured at 37 degrees Celsius, and that, from what I know, is a normal body temperature. It isn't too high. Here they ordered different CT scans for her. They again have given her a diagnosis of severe depression with suicidal attempt, and they have also stated what kind of treatment she was receiving during her stay at that hospital. From that medical report, we can see CT scans have been requested, and there were these journalists that succeeded in achieving the results of the CT scans, and I will put them here on the screen, and according to the experts that they have consulted, the nature of the injuries here indicate that Magda was unconscious or dead, at the time of the fall. We know she wasn't dead. Well, we do have the footage here as well, but yes, we know that she wasn't actually dead. So here it would be unconscious at this point. And when asked why, 
these private investigators and analysts have said that the injuries seem to have only occurred on one side of her body. They have stated that usually, in the case of suicides, either instinct or self-preservations, like things that we can't psychologically control, can work, and such a person then jumps more or less on his feet. And people have said this isn't so far from the floor, whether it is first or second floor. We just don't actually have the height, which would be the first thing that me as an investigator or somebody looking into this would have looked at. But people have said that this was a survivable fall. So let's say there is that case of self-preservation. The person either tries to jump on the feet, is successful or not, but most of the damage is to the legs. The pelvis gets cracked, and often the limbs dig into the abdominal part, and completely different sets of injuries occurs. In this case, according to these experts, the injuries indicate that the body was thrown out of the window, and that it was completely inert. According to them, in these images, we see that most of the injuries occurred on the left side of the body. And according to the medical reports they have received, these injuries are specifically a shattered left leg, a pierced left lung, and left-sided head damage. In real time, six minutes after the fall, Hospital monitoring will record that Magda was now kept in a ward for two hours while she was isolated at the same hospital. And after spending those two hours in the intensive care kind of unit, she would then be transported to a larger facility, which would be 286 kilometers away in Urgada. So here we see some CCTV footage. She is transported in a van, and then at around 7.30 to 8 a.m. she gets into that hospital in Urgada. While she is in that hospital, that friend from Poland, Maciek, arrives, and he hears that she is there, so he arrives at the hospital, hears that Magda is stable, and that she might need to be transported to Poland. He, according to some sources, also sees her while she's kept in the artificial coma, and they tell him that the injuries are severe, that she had the injuries to her right lung, and the injury was dangerous. She was losing a lot of blood, and she needs an operation. He would also state that Mahmoud was still there, and that he witnessed that it seemed like Magda had scratched his face badly. There's no evidence of this, no interview, no pictures, nothing. So Magda's family hears that she is in the intensive care, they call the insurance company in order to try to get them to pay for her transport so that she is treated back home. And just as they're trying to arrange the flight for her themselves, they get the news that she passed away. So according to the medical report, she died on Sunday, April the 30th, at 5.30 p.m. So about 15 hours after she fell from that hospital window. Before Magda's autopsies even took place, before her body was transported back to Poland, this case had gotten some traction, and immediately in Poland everybody found this to be super suspicious. This led Zhuk family to, on the 4th of May, approach a private detective, forward slash reality star. He's a guy of many traits, and he is apparently a known figure in Poland. This person called Krzysztof Rutkowski, who announced that the family had approached him to launch his own investigation. So, this guy is famous. I couldn't find, like, his actual skits, but it just seems like he isn't super squeaky clean. He has accused people of corruption and arrested them, apparently, and they have been found to be innocent. And he has created this personal image of himself portraying and he has created this image of himself, portraying him as the action hero. He has his own TV show, and here he reenacts episodes of him undertaking rescue operations. I couldn't find these on YouTube, I could find him giving interviews, but here, again, if you're Polish, is he a respectable figure? Is he not? Because just like with everything on this case, people argue on that point. 
What he had done well in the early investigation in this case was place the seed of doubt in people's heads. Because on 9th of May, the publications in Poland, the newspaper articles, were all surrounding how they don't believe the Egyptian version of events, claiming that Magda has committed suicide, that she has jumped out of that window on her own volition. Rudkowski would say to different journalists that Magda couldn't have died from falling from the second floor because she was athletic and she was also a marathon runner. He instead proposed she had either been drugged by an organized rape gang in which Mahmoud Kairi played a key role. He also called for the dismissal of Polish ambassador to Egypt and had organized two protests. The first one was outside the Egyptian embassy in Warsaw, urging the authorities to punish those responsible for the death of Magdalena and ensure greater security at tourist resorts. Another one was a week later, demanding that murderers be punished. Because of the pressure that he has been putting on the authorities, they have finally stepped up. So, there was the main inquiry, of course, because they need to investigate whether or not the crime happened. The national prosecutor also accepted the request from her parents to oversee the investigation personally, and even the Minister of Justice has been put on the case in order to facilitate the relations between the two countries. This led to two autopsies. One was performed in Egypt on 9th of May, with a Polish official present, and the second autopsy was performed in Poland on 19th of May. The Prosecutor General Zbigniew Ziobro also said to the journalists that there are two reasons why the General Prosecutor's Office and the Minister are involved in this case. Firstly, because he is still not discarding the option of organized crime, something related to trafficking in human beings. And then, that issue is also closely related to the explanation of the safety of Polish tourists abroad. During those early appearances, he tried to also make the public aware of the social media recruitment strategies, and basically he just didn't discard any option. He said, there could have been trafficking in human beings, trafficking in women, sexual exploitation of women, administering pharmacological agents, which could have caused irrational behavior of this young woman, who, according to preliminary findings, was not supposed to reveal this type of behavior. This narrative by the prosecutors will soon change, because a week and a half after Magdalena's death, her first autopsy took place. This had happened in Egypt with the participation of the Polish pathomorphologist and prosecutor, and then the second one will follow in Poland. Now, the cause of death, according to records, no reports here yet again, is suffocation caused by embolism in the lungs. Embolism meaning a blocked artery, so eventually the blood wouldn't be able to flow to your organs. And this was due to her fall. Now, the cause of death, I didn't see people debate on. It's rather whether that fall has been due to her committing suicide or whether it was intentional. Even though Polish representatives were present during this autopsy, they had no permission to take their own samples from the body for any form of research. There will be only few details that were revealed to the public from this autopsy. One of them would be that Magda was not found to be the victim of violence or sexual assault. I have not seen the clarification here on the private investigator's comments on the bodily fluid being found on her, just that she had no sexual intercourse in Egypt, not even voluntarily, no defensive wounds by anybody or DNA traces under her fingernails. After hearing those conclusions, no defensive wounds, no rape, and also the injuries that would be explained by somebody jumping out of the window, the Polish prosecution team ruled out that Magda was also a victim of human trafficking. Now, when it comes to the reports on Magda's tox exam, meaning what drugs were in her system, Certain reports online state that there were traces of potent drugs that were found in her blood. 
I haven't seen the names of the drugs, but people have said they were antipsychotic drugs, a substance used to treat psychosis, schizophrenia, but also something for depression. And that the Egyptians have indeed confirmed before her death Magda was taking depression drugs. We don't know what the drug, who gave it to her, was it at the hospital, is this official information because there's no official confirming this, how far ago was she given this drug when she was given the first one during her first visit on the 28th, or during that evening. But after the Egyptians finished this first autopsy, and when it was time for the Polish investigators to do their own autopsy back home, Magda's body had been delivered to them, chemically treated and embalmed. What this means, and Rutkowski, the hair guy, the detective, would say that was a one-sided decision by the Egyptian team, is that her bloods and liquids have been removed from her body. So now what the family was waiting for was for the Egyptian authorities to send the autopsy report, the toxicological reports, everything that has been found during that first autopsy, because the second one is going to be significantly different. What this means is that any toxicological examinations that the Polish authorities are now to perform are not reliable. And if you remember, during the first autopsy, the Polish reps that were there were forbidden to take any samples. So now the family and everybody in Poland, the prosecution office, is completely dependent on whatever the reports that were done in Egypt are to state. And those reports, up until this very date, in 2022, are yet to be sent to Poland. Please tell me that I have glitched here. Please tell me that I have missed something. I would rather eat up my words and be like, you know what, I'm actually shit at this. I'm actually really shit at this research and I have missed out on like some crucial thing. I mean, there's a language barrier after all. Rather than telling you that this is technically, apart from a few more details, where this case stands to this very day, almost five years later. This brings us to May the 23rd, 2017, when Magdalena Zhuk was buried. Her friends, family, and several hundreds of others who were touched by Magdalena's story came to attend her funeral at the cemetery in Bogatinia with Magda's favorite flowers in hand, sunflowers. The priest said, Today we are plunged into pain after her death. The mystery of life and death is such that only God knows why Magdalena left us so early. After her funeral and the cause of death made public, the Polish press wasn't convinced. They would publish headlines along the lines of 27-year-old Paul murdered in Egypt. And they all focused on that 14-minute call that was now circulating the internet. The papers were immediately filled with a suspicion falling onto the last person that emerges on that phone call, a guy they soon learned was named Mahmoud Kairi. In the eyes of the Polish public, Mahmoud quickly became a murder suspect, even though there was no evidence in his death. So what I have found had been done in Egypt was that the police interviewed Mahmoud shortly after, but they released him without ever charging him. People in Marsalam said that he had disappeared since, he had deleted his Facebook account after pictures of him started circulating in the Polish tabloids. He didn't respond to any interviews, but he said everything said in the papers about him is a lie, and Rainbow Tours also declined an interview. Let me know in the comments if you are from that area and if you have any reliable information, the emphasis on reliable about Mahmoud now. I tried looking him up, I didn't invest insane amount of time in this, but apparently it's not an uncommon name, so there are multiple accounts online with that name, I just didn't match up anybody with his face, so maybe he just still hasn't created another social media account. And from all of my records, he has never been charged with this. So, you know, he hasn't been looked into or investigated further 
beyond this point. So let's talk about where this case stands now. If you remember, we left it off with a family waiting on the autopsy report, the toxicological report, and also from what I gathered, all of the investigation that happened in Egypt, like the footage from the hotel, from the hospitals, further footage from the hospitals, anything that can help them determine what has happened here. And that has been postponed. So from all of the articles, 2019, you would say the investigation has been extended for another six months. And then six months later, it will be like extended for yet another six months. That was until September 2020, so almost three and a half years after Magda's death. This would be when Polish Prosecution Office will receive the autopsy report. This is according to what I reckon is a tabloid called Fakt in um, Poland. So, again, take it with a grain of salt. Here, what was revealed by the spokesperson for the district's prosecutor's office was that the documents from Egypt are consistent with the data resulting from the documents previously provided in this area. So, at least when it comes to the autopsy, there wasn't any breakthrough, because now both of these autopsies didn't find any traces of rape and beating on Magdalena's body. Now, the next step is the toxicological reports and the comprehensive medical opinion, and those still haven't been sent to Poland. On the other side of things, in this article from April of 2021, I have found that the Polish prosecution team has been conducting their own investigation. As mentioned, nearly 200 witnesses were questioned in this case. They have also examined, apparently, victim's luggage, her mobile phone, numerous ICT data. The files of this investigation already include over 20 volumes, each of which has 200 pages. Prosecutors apparently collected evidence, including the medical records of Magda's in Poland, so that's why we know that she had been getting some therapy for the alcoholic parent. They inspected phones and laptops belonging to her and to her partner, and they collected opinions of experts in the fields of forensic medicine, toxicology, biology, computer science, psychiatry, and psychology. And the prosecutor, Tsulovsky, said that because this is an ongoing case, it's not possible at this stage to give details of the individual pieces of evidence. From the general consensus online that I also agree with, it just seems like the prosecution office isn't to be let off the hook either, because it looks like they're picking and choosing the information they're sharing, and it looks like they're doing it so it fits their narrative. Like, oh, the autopsy report had been sent, and it indicates the exact same thing that we have been saying. So, sort of, again, going into our favor. Magda has been receiving some therapy before in her life, which, like, didn't have anything to do with her, but if you put it into people's heads, then they start believing maybe she did have a psychotic break, maybe she did choose to commit suicide on her own accord, and plenty of people will disagree with this. So, where this stands now, investigation-wise, is that apparently the prosecutor's office has conducted their own investigation on all of these individuals in Poland, Nobody, from what I have found, has been put behind bars, and they're still waiting on the toxicological reports. And I hope they're still also waiting for the camera footage from the airport, the hotel, the hospital, anything else that possibly, hopefully, the Egyptian authorities have not just deleted. Which you have to wonder, after almost five years, why did these documents not get sent over? Why do we have screenshots of some, and apparently some have been sent over three and a half years later, when they have been conducted then and there, in the presence of Polish officials? Why does it take that long? Like, what are we trying to hide? Or is this gonna be that situation where they're gonna prolong it, prolong it for six more months, six more months, until they think people are gonna forget about it? That's one other reason why I'm doing this video, because people will not forget about it. You can't just forget about the evidence 
in a case that hasn't been solved, where the family needs their answers. So let us talk about the family, because they do not think that their daughter had any medical health issues that would have caused her to behave in such a way upon reaching Egypt. And they don't believe that she had committed suicide. So, in 2019, the family actually went to Egypt. They brought the journalist along, and they have actually interviewed a couple of people in that hospital, in the hotel. They have gone to the hospital, to the actual room, to see where Magda would have fallen from. And they have spoken to the nurse, and that's why we have the contradictions in the story of where Magda's body had been found. The family's main reason for going to Egypt, though, was to get copies of files on Magdalena's death. And here, at a cafe, they would meet with a lawyer, so an Egyptian official. And Anna, Magda's sister, would say that this is how that meeting went. That it lasted for a few hours, but it soon became apparent that the investigation files were sent to the public prosecutor's office in Cairo. And according to that lawyer, the family had no access to them. So, instead of receiving the files, this lawyer had suggested to them for him to obtain that access for Magda's dad to state and sign that his daughter has committed suicide. Then the procedure would be terminated immediately and the family would receive copies of the file. Magda's sister would say that this saddened her because they know that a lot of people contributed to her death. That's indicated by the recordings. And it's documented in the Egyptian report, which they can't talk about. Of course, Magda's dad also said, no, they are not signing any documents, because what that would mean is that the death is ruled out as suicide, and nobody is going to investigate it. I mean, nobody in Poland. It seemed like in Egypt, this already has been the case of nobody investigating this. The interesting point here is, if it's true what this lawyer is saying, why are her reports in Cairo? Like, I don't know what the connection there is at all. So, during this trip, the family would also interview other people. One of them would be the hotel manager. This guy said that he has worked for 31 years in the hotel industry, and this is the first time that he has seen such behavior that Magda was displaying. He said that Magda would be running and falling herself, and it looked like she was doing it on purpose. This hotel manager was called because he heard that Magda wanted to jump off the slope, that she would appear in the hotel lobby in her underwear, pulling off her jeans. Quote, maybe she went mad because she was alone, or maybe she used drugs. Maybe, I don't know. Here in the country, it's very hard to get drugs. When someone smoked hashish cigarettes, I had to notify the police. If I don't notify the police, and the police catch someone outside and ask them from which hotel they're coming, I'm going to jail first. End quote. So, he says that the policemen apparently come around regularly to check that nothing illegal is happening, all in order to protect their tourism. But he ended this interview saying that he is 100% sure she took some medication before she arrived there. And here I have a question for you, because if we are to believe the sequence of events here, Magda did start acting strangely from the moment that she reached Egypt, rather the moment that we know that she reached the hotel. So, here, if anything was to have happened, I particularly see a gap in that transport. How did Magda make it from Urgada to Marsala, because that's where I see something happening. Not the potential boat. Possibly, yes, like, possibly somebody could have been spiking the drinks, she was seen drinking, etc. But that is the gap where I would want to know more information on. And one other quick note, and I will go back to this in the theory section, but it does seem like with the first entrance to the hospital, you know, the footage and the information that we have, even though the witnesses are stating different things, that if drugs were involved, it seems like the drugs that she was to have consumed first would almost possibly have a calming effect. 
I mean, she was, after all, pictured lying on her bed, hiding her face, collapsing on the floor, walking into that hospital in a calm way. And then, at some point, by that phone call with Marcus and the second hospital visit, it seems like if drugs were involved, it was a different kind of drugs. The ones that would make her hyper, like the complete opposite of how she was behaving. So here, in the storyline 2019, the family also spoke with a hospital manager. The hospital manager pretty much concluded on the same thing, that they have nothing to hide, but he said a few interesting things. He checked the archive and apparently concluded that the archive on Magda's case was not kept by the Egyptian prosecutor's office. He found the CT scans that were taken just after she fell out of the window, and these pictures were the ones that Anna and Magda's dad haven't seen before. They haven't even been shared with them. And when he was asked about drug testing, the manager replied that such tests had not been carried out in the hospital. She behaved normally and changed within two seconds. If you are looking for the answers, do not look for reasons in the hospital. You have to find out what happened to her before she came here. She came to us. I would like you to say that the source of her problem lies in Poland and not with us. We have nothing to hide. Here they also spoke to the nurse, and apparently they lit up a candle in the room where Magda was last held. The nurse told them that Magda was found closer to the aircon, but when the dad asked how exactly she was lying, this nurse couldn't describe it. According to another translation of yet another article in the papers online, apparently here during this visit, the family actually got some form of recordings. Here it states that they got a CD with a recording from the hospital, and this turned out was damaged and they couldn't read it. According to Anna's sister, this is yet another proof for her that the Egyptian side doesn't care, and it's not surprising because they live off of tourism, and this matter would become a problem for them. She also says this is a very sad reflection, because every year a lot of Poles go to Egypt for holidays, and it turns out that if they are harmed there, there's no guarantee that the truth will ever be established, and that justice will be given to the guilty parties. In one of the interviews, Anna, Magda's sister, said, For our family, April is the worst month of the year. For four years, we have not been able to mourn in peace, because the matter of Magda's death keeps coming back, and has not been clarified yet. It is very tiring for us, and the prosecutor's office only spreads his hands. Until they are to see any further reports, the family said that they believe that Magda was murdered that they will not change their mind, but they're not able to prove it because it's not supported by the documents that still don't exist. Those are the nuts and bolts of this case. We're going to be talking about some further details now when discussing theories. However, that is the latest that I could find. April 2021, articles on Polish websites. Listen, I have googled Polish newspapers, then gone into quite a few searched using that magnifier, and that's it. I recognize there's quite a few months between April and now, so let me know if I have missed out on something. I'm gonna pin it. Let me know also the source so that people know that it is legit. Now we are gonna be talking about theories. Here I'm only gonna be talking about free. They're kind of widespread, so let me know if something that you have thought of doesn't fall under those free. The first theory is no foul play, that Magda had had a psychotic break or one of the few things that I see possible. The second one is that there was foul play and the perpetrators are all in Egypt, that nobody from Poland has any connections to this and that whatever happened to Magda happened during this trip. And then the third possibility here that I see and so many people online see is sex trafficking, so organized crime. It started in Poland and then it was executed in Egypt. Just like I always do with these mystery cases, let me go through a flow. So just like a short flow of how this would have happened. So the no foul play is what we are discussing first. 
Magda plans the trip. Marcus doesn't know that it's happening until seven hours before. The resort, Marsa Alam, isn't famous for partying, isn't famous, and doesn't have a track record for sex trafficking. The odd behavior only begins once Magda gets to that resort. If this is some form of temporary psychotic break, then that continues for the next few days. It can possibly be induced by sleep deprivation or lack of food, drinking, I mean, that can extend to spiked drinks and drugs, in which case this isn't the no-foul-play situation. She is always trying to escape a bad situation. There's a pattern of trying to do the same. So, at the airport, in that hospital, when she's trying to reach for the blinds, the call, and then some would say, well, the suicide attempts. Like, every time when she is in that state, she's trying to run away from something, from somebody, to run or hide or jump towards the first point of exit. Because of that, because of her physically trying to jump out of what she considers, because of the temporary psychosis or something, some mental health issue that she hadn't had before, she decides to jump out of that window. And that is the conclusion of the autopsy report. There was no foul play, no sexual assault or rape, and that the injuries have been induced due to that fall. I actually thought a lot more people will disagree with this type of theory, but then I looked at Reddit, and a lot of people have upvoted this. Rather, they have upvoted the next comment, where somebody said, speaking as a psychiatrist, it seems pretty clear that she had an acute psychotic episode. Those scenes at a hospital are fairly typical, where staff are undertrained. The language barrier also doesn't help them talk her down, which leaves questions as to whether the episode was spontaneous or caused by a drug, ingested voluntarily or involuntarily. She probably was trying to run away when she fell, not realizing the danger or thinking it was worth the risk for the chance of escaping. I would have been very skeptical towards this theory of temporary psychosis had I not covered three cases on the podcast of Folia Do, which is madness for two. In those cases, usually there's an instigator, usually it is happening because of some form of isolation, where the two people get completely fixated onto something that doesn't seem rational to anybody, and they go together through this temporary psychosis. It's usually happening within, like, families or two partners, somebody that you are completely isolated with for a substantial amount of time, and it happens due to stress and, like, other factors. And in those cases, the instigator party, once they're removed from the equation, the other party sort of just immediately starts behaving normally. So here, of course, that wouldn't have been the case because there's no other party that was that close to Magda at that stage. However, the temporary psychosis isn't anything new. It can be triggered by a number of different things, like physical illness or injury. You may see or hear things if you have a high fever or a head injury or some sort of lead or mercury poisoning, it happened due to abuse and trauma, recreational drugs, alcohol and smoking, and prescribed medication. What I haven't seen taken into account anywhere in this story is that Magda was leading an extremely healthy lifestyle, by all accounts. So, here, even if her alcohol wasn't to have been spiked, but if she was suddenly getting a shock to her system just because of the amount that she was taking, that could have contributed to something like this happening. Now, I know that that kind of contradicts what I have said before, which is that her behavior started being odd on the night of, not the day of, when she started drinking. So, psychosis in itself is a symptom, and if it's not treated early, it can develop into more intense experiences, including hallucinations and illusions. You can experience it for a short period of time, and it usually develops gradually, over a period of two weeks or less, 
and if treated, you're likely to fully recover within a few months, weeks, or even days. Based off of the evidence and the autopsy report and the videos online, I am inclined to give this theory some credit, to still believe in it. It can be very easily discredited, in which case I'm over with it, because there are so many things that could have contributed here, even if we are saying it was temporary psychosis, it could have happened because somebody gave her spiked alcohol, because somebody gave her drugs. However, knowing what I now know, having researched the aftermath of this story and not just focused everything based off of those videos, rather having taken the family's opinions into account, possibly the next theory might be where I'm leaning towards, and that is foul play, everything foul play-ish happening in Egypt. The hypothesis here is spiking her alcohol or giving her drugs for the purposes of rape, sexual assault, possible blackmail then, and it doesn't involve organized crime. What fits into that theory is that Magda was, according to all sources, acting completely normally before getting to Egypt and on her flight there. Then, that night, Possibly during her transportation to the hotel, something happens. The next day, she is drinking heavily, even more possible opportunities for spiking her drink. From that point on, Magda falls a victim to blackmailers then, whether it is Mahmoud, whether it is the people that we have never identified. As a young single woman there, it would be easy to control her, to drug her, then possibly bring her onto that boat, if you're buying into that theory, where some sort of sex game that I will be mentioning now would happen, and after that, they would possibly record it, they would find a way to blackmail her, and that would drive her to suicide. On the sex game part of that equation, there are plenty of reports here on a ritual that is called taharush. To call this what it is, it is a gang rape. But from what I read, it is used to penalize women for leaving the house, for dressing provocatively. Viewing, viewing the sexual violence as a source of shame for the victim, not the attacker. Magda dressed in a way that was considered normal in Europe. However, here in Egypt, it would arouse aggression. In this gang rape sex game, whatever you want to call it, a group of men would surround a lone, defenseless woman, and they would touch her, undress her, penetrate her with their fingers. Taharush would often end in mass rape, but not always. Here, people point to Magda's lines in that video call. They have different tricks here. They're doing everything to me here. And also those unspoken words where Magda supposedly said through her lips, I've been raped. If that had happened, a lot of people believe that Magda was then further blackmailed, that they were holding something over her head, her phone might have been taken away from her, from all we know, and that is why her attacker, the perpetrator of the crime, was the person who was controlling her communication with the outside world. They then didn't want this reported, they would give her drugs that would cause her body to go into shock, not to be able to communicate, and if she was to communicate, well, nobody would have taken that seriously based on her state and her whole behavior, and not expecting or expecting then how she will react considering that she has never taken such drugs before. If this was the case, then everybody on that side, everybody in Egypt, people inside of that hospital, would have to be in on it to a certain degree. Because if we are saying she was pushed to death, if she was murdered, well, that would either mean that that nurse who untied her was behind it, or that she was covering for somebody. For her to be in this subdued state, though, this theory would also involve some form of drugs. 
And here there are different reports. Some of them are saying that the media reported new evidence in 2019, but then there are forums with this type of evidence, quote unquote evidence, because we know nothing has been revealed from the case files circulating since 2017, since this had happened. And now it seemed like in 2019 somebody put it back in circulation, saying that traces of a very popular African medicine called cut were found in Magdalena's body. Cut is a stimulant whose effects last between 90 minutes to 3 hours, and in brain it increases the level of dopamine, and also it stimulates the release of a stress hormone, making you super hyper. The effects cut can cause are euphoria, loss of appetite, increased energy, increased sociability, increased alertness, cheerfulness, sense of well-being, reduction of boredom. A few points that don't support this theory. Her sister Anna said that Magda was the enemy of the drugs, so she wouldn't have taken it voluntarily. And weed cut and the next drug that cut is part of, that we are going to be talking about, the consumption is quite specific. Like, cut in itself is a herb. She would have had to chew it. And from all we know, I don't even think that Magda was eating throughout her time and her stay at that resort. Then if the effects of it last between only 90 minutes to 3 hours, how would these perpetrators know that it would be effective? That, you know, after those 3 hours, she wouldn't say something. The effects would have worn off by that point. And also something that the tox reports would be useful towards is to confirm if she was ever to consume any of the drugs like cut or flaca, well, did she take any other drugs? Or rather, was she given, forced upon any other drugs? Because, if you remember, she was much calmer on her first and second day, and then it was that hospital visit and that call that she started behaving erratically at all times. And I know some of you are screaming at me that she was given on the 28th midazolam, whatever it's called, in the hospital, which is technically the complete opposite of cut. However, how are we seeing this story flow then? So what was she spiked with before? Because if this was in her system, that would mean that she was probably given this kind of drug in the last day or in the last couple of hours before her death. So if you buy into this theory, what do you presume that she had been given before? Was it just different doses? Are we just not aware of these effects? And does anybody know if this kind of drug would actually show up in the system or would it just disappear after a few hours? Now, cut in itself is just a basis for a synthetic and much stronger version of a drug that's called flaca. Flaca is known as a zombie drug. It gives you the high that is similar to cocaine, but it is much more dangerous to the body because it makes your body temperature rise, so people often under the influence of this drug take their clothes off. Some of the symptoms are paranoia, strange hallucinations, psychosis, and excited delirium. These symptoms now on their own lead to self-injury, violent aggression, or cause people who have taken this drug to have a psychotic episode. The drug in itself can cause failure of the kidneys, hypertension, narrowing of the blood vessels, irregular heartbeat, heart attack, stroke, aneurysm, and death. And it also gives people superhuman strength, where it takes a lot of people to hold them down. The drug is also extremely cheap. It is now widespread in the US, and you can get it for up to $5. And the reports that I have seen are all, like, just graphic in nature. Like a person taking something like Flaca and then physically attacking another human, and because of that strength, they just go for the most brutal crimes. Like, the most popular article, if you were to Google flaca-related crimes, would be of, I think it was in Florida, of this woman attacking somebody and actually eating through their face, like, up until they literally died. Nobody could save this person. It's... it's something else. 
The problem with Flaka fitting into this theory, though, is that it is consumed by either being smoked, vaped with an e-cigarette, snorted, injected, or swallowed. So it looks like sea salts. So how would Magda not have noticed that she is consuming something like this? From what I read, when heated up, so let's say somebody is actually trying to melt that in order to put it into her drink, it gives off a foul-smelling smoke characterized as smelling like dirty socks. To finalize on this theory, the only way I see it flowing is if Magda was given something else. Not by the hospital the first time, not those tranquilizers, but rather the perpetrators here on the night of. Like, immediately something was set into motion, whether it is because of Takarush, whether it is because during this transport they have seen how Magda was dressed and that pissed them off because of misogynistic kind of views, and they have given something to calm her down so that they can then abuse her, sexually assault her, whether it is in the room, we have no idea what happened there, or on the ship, and then at some point before that call, before whether you consider it to be an alibi, or whether maybe Marcus has said that the call is recorded. What if he did tell Mahmoud that? And then at some point before that call and before the second visit to that hospital, she was given something like Flaka, some sort of stimulant, because her behavior is different. What doesn't fit this theory is that they couldn't have predicted how Magda would react. Like, if there were any other you know, foreign tourist-related deaths that happened this way, we would have probably known of those stories. Like, somebody would have connected that and would have connected those deaths to the same agency, the same resident that has been working there. But we don't have that here. However, why I am not discarding this theory whatsoever is because I have researched on the aftermath of events. And I know that the reports haven't been sent to the family, the toxicological reports that would confirm drugs in the system for about five years. And I can't explain in a logical way where something shady isn't going on, where somebody's uncovering shit up, that particular fact. Because even if they were to come and publish the autopsy reports, the toxicological reports now, would you believe them? Would you believe that they hadn't been manufactured if you had waited on them for five years? Because we know what those reports would have said. The only option where I might be prone into buying is if the Egyptian authorities suddenly come through and they're like, we have made the arrest, we have been investigating this for five years, here is the toxicological report, this is the very particular reason why we haven't released it so far. But I somehow doubt that that is going to happen. And I have to wonder why. Why, if they have done it then and there, if there has been, you know, Polish representatives who have been there that can vouch for that, and they have sent certain things back to Poland, why not send everything? It just doesn't seem like a logical explanation. The third theory here is foul play, sex trafficking, that it started in Poland, that Magda had been sought out, and then she had been sent to Egypt, where immediately she would be picked up, she would be drugged, she would be blackmailed, and possibly there was some operation there going on. The three most common types of human trafficking are sex trafficking, forced labor, and debt bondage. So here we can exclude forced labor, however, we are still not excluding sex trafficking and debt bondage. Egypt is having some really disturbing stats when it comes to forced labor and sex trafficking in particular, where the government reported convicting 330 perpetrators for these crimes in 2020. And that was an increase from 67 convictions during the previous reporting period. The sentences also can range from a one-year imprisonment, which is nothing, a fine of about 100,000 Egyptian pounds to 15 years behind bars. The way that human traffickers target their victims nowadays is usually 
throughout social media. So it is either through online ads, you know, offering romance, offering a relationship, trying to lure somebody over, through false job ads, lies about educational or travel opportunities, and some other cases include like sale by family or recruitment from former slaves. They would always aim to lure the person who is desperate enough, who needs a job desperately, who has no friends or family that will then look after them, that will actually investigate the case, and usually there is some form of language barrier. Here we know that Magda wasn't fluent in English, and that's why probably she would have leaned towards Mahmoud helping her, because he was somehow fluent in Polish. So, in the video that I have mentioned at the beginning of this particular case on Operation Fort, exposure is what usually gets these people discovered. Operation Fort was about a gang who would recruit people in Poland, who they knew already that they didn't speak English well, they would promise them this great salary, this amazing accommodation, and then they would basically put them on the cheapest form of transport, on a bus. They would transport them to the cities in the UK, and the people would live in absolute squalor. They would open up their bank accounts, they would, they would be constantly supervised by these people that have trafficked them. They would open the bank accounts in their name, and then all of the earnings that they would be getting by slaving themselves for over 12 hours a day would be going to those traffickers. The traffickers would also make sure that they take their identity away from them, basically leaving them dependent on them, the debt bondage part of that whole equation. So they would take their passports, their IDs, all of the money that they're earning would go directly into the account of the traffickers. Now, this would leave these people completely dependent on them and other workers, because there was always a language barrier as well, they didn't know how to speak to anybody else, or even how to escape. What would lead to escape in those situations, however, was always exposure. That's how we know of the story of the Operation Ford, that's how the whole gang had actually been exposed. And in that case, they were caught because they would not really feed these people anything, so they would let them go to a food bank. And here, somebody actually spoke up, and that's how the whole operation has been unraveled. Which leads me to our case here, and if we are believing into this theory of foul play, a lot of people are simply revealing their faces where they shouldn't be. It just doesn't seem like a well-oiled operation, because what is the goal here? Like, if it is some form of trafficking, somebody needs to make some profit out of it. And if it is organized crime, which sex trafficking is, well, is this their first time doing it? Now, you might say, well, Maya, it resulted to be successful. If it was, we still don't have the conclusions of it, do we? And it seems like everybody is in on it. Yes, but also, the world is not just gonna let go of this case. I fucking won't. People won't just let this be the thing of the past. People won't just forget about it. And also, they know the names of the individuals and most of their faces, from at least even what I could find online. So, if you believe in this theory, just again, paint it as a flow to me, because there was a tour agency that was involved. Then she arrives to the resort where, again, she can just run up to any member of the hotel staff and these people would be discovered. Then they're talking on the call with Marcus. Why was that phone call then recorded? Why would you record a call where every single person is part of a sex trafficking ring? Mahmoud's phone was used to communicate with the family. Yet again, if he is one of the main instigators of this crime, why use his phone? Why have that on the record? There's a lot of unnecessary things that I don't think fit into this story, that I just want somebody who believes in this particular theory to let me know down below why and how. How is it, like, all woven into? What is the sequence of events? But let's say, for the purpose of the flow of this theory, that she, Magda, had been sought and everything started in Poland. 
To support that theory, we have information that these people all knew each other. So we know from that phone call that Zloty, whose name is Camille, that he knew Marcus because obviously he had his number, he was calling him for whatever reason. We know that Marcus and Magda knew each other, that they dated. So we know those two things for sure. Now, who is recording the phone call? That is said to be a guy named Michal. And then we also know of the friend Maciek that was sent from Poland to Egypt to supposedly bring Magda back. Would that have happened? What do you think would have happened there? In this theory where everybody knows each other, why did they send somebody over? Marcus is a hairdresser, supposedly from Germany. All of them lived in Wroclaw and they met through that nightclub called Grey. In theory, this information isn't suspicious. That is, until you learn that Zloty might have actually been involved in another suspicious suicide. And this was the case of Karolina Kacorowska. This alleged suicide happened in Poland. It happened in Karpats. Karolina, just like Magda, was ambitious. She was making good money out of her modeling, she had her own flat in London, and she was able to pay for the overnight hotel stays for everyone she invited to her birthday. So, after one such party in January of 2016, she decides to stay at the hotel for the rest of the weekend with her ex-boyfriend, Camille, known as Zloty. Something happens that makes Camille leave that hotel unexpectedly, and then, an hour later, late at night at around 11 p.m., Carolina goes out for a walk with her dog. The hotel cameras record that happen, but after a few minutes, she comes back. It just looked like, you know, coming back because you have forgotten something inside of the room. But soon after, the neighbors start complaining about the dog's barking. And the security guard came to that room. He listened if anybody is in, but he didn't act. He didn't do anything that night. And the hotel cameras would be turned off for the night until the morning. And the next morning, the cleaners found Carolina's body hanging in the bathroom. Here, the prosecution office did have a toxicological analysis, and they found amphetamines in her system and also, reportedly, in the alcohol that she was consuming. But there were a lot of inconsistencies here, not just that she returned from going to that walk with her dog only a few minutes after leaving that hotel, it was reported that she was found in a full ski suit, that she was sitting, and that's how the suicide had happened, and that also the knot that she had used, the cable that she just found in this hotel room, was quite a precise knot. And when the Lampard investigation group had analyzed this case, they have also said that the shower head doesn't actually have the capacity to withstand the type of pressure of Carolina's weight and just the weight of her stiff body later. Just like in Magda's case, the prosecution here had concluded that this was indeed a suicide. But the Lampard Group investigators have found out that both Carolina and Magda knew Marcus, Magda's boyfriend. This, from what I've seen, is all based off of the witness testimonies. Marcus will deny it. And both women, Carolina and Magda, apparently went to the Grey nightclub. Zloty, from what I have seen, hadn't been looked into as a suspect here, even though apparently he was at the same hotel the same night. And Marcus had said that his colleagues' and friends' connections to the Carpats case are complete nonsense. So, according to Marcus, he wasn't even connected to Zloty back in 2016. Camille, Zloty had never been looked into seriously, but according to these private investigators, he actually fled the country soon after Carolina's supposed suicide. If any of this information is true, we do know that Zloty and Marcus did, by some accounts, by some form, know each other in 2017 because of that phone call. So, let's suppose we pick it up from here. Somehow, through that nightclub, you know, the communications might not have been even recorded on the phone if the Polish prosecution office had actually done their due diligence. So, she 
is then transported to Egypt, to Urgada. Marcus always knew in this account of events that his passport has expired, because it has expired actually in 2016, if you remember that screenshot. Here in Egypt, Magda is then raped, she's blackmailed, she can't trust anybody, her phone has been taken away from her. We never know if her ID has also been taken away from her, and that's something that I would like to know. Mahmoud speaks Polish, that is suspicious in itself, nobody really clarifies that. What goes to support this theory is that human traffickers are known to drug people in order to make them easier to control and to kidnap. They often limit the amount of exposure that you have after completely dehumanizing you, taking your identity and making you dependent on them. In this theory, however, I cannot logically explain where this goes from this point on. Because if this is any form of organized crime, if this is something to do with sex trafficking, somebody is profiting out of it. And that would mean paper trail, whether it is Marcus's bank account, where he is then supposed to be deposited some amount of money, or Mahmoud's. Or if he is saying, well, this can be executed without a paper trail, then one of them would have to travel to the other country to then pick up money and physically transport it back home by a plane. So maybe that is where you see that guy Matsek fitting in. Maybe that's why he actually traveled. How? Like, <laughs> just explain it to me. Because not only by default in this story did they not profit here, if the prosecutor's office in Poland has actually done any investigation and has checked Marcus's accounts, but they have actually spent more money buying this guy a ticket to actually go, buying Magda's a different ticket. So that just doesn't translate in my head. If you see something that I don't, let me know. And one last thing on the money. If this has now fallen through, this probably wasn't the supposed result if we are suspecting trafficking, then why not give the person up? Like, they don't live in the same country, for all we know. Like, why not then say what the situation here was and just blame it completely on another person? Yes, that would implicate them, but also I can see somebody who is doing this particularly for the money snitching on a different person, because you have just gotten out of a lucrative deal or something that you supposed will be a good chunk of money, and you might be pissed about it. You might sleep up on some level. The blatant holes in this theory, why take her to the hospital in the first place, that shouldn't have been part of the equation, because then somebody's gonna have to have a medical record on Magda. Why take her to the airport? Yes, there's no footage there, so this is, again, just a story, but then the police or the prosecution must have records of that ticket having been bought, Magda's ticket back to Poland. Then why put Marcus on the phone? Why put Mahmoud on the phone? Why did he take it? Like, why incriminate himself like that? There are just so many risks that have been taken that weren't really necessary if this is some sort of operation. You might say what fits into this theory is that Mahmoud deleted his social media accounts and that this is probably done because that would make the connection between him and Maciek and Marcus obvious, that they were Facebook friends. I don't know that for sure. I don't know if anybody took screenshots of that before that account was deleted, but yes, that could fit then into that theory and would sort of then we will need to ask how did they know Mahmoud prior to this trip. If I was to ask the Polish prosecution office to you know, release certain parts of information that I would personally find pertinent to this story if we can't have the access to all of the case files. What I would like to know is, is the screenshot of Marcus's passport the correct one? Has his passport actually been expired? Is there any connection in any sort of paper trail between these individuals? Are there any money transactions? Did anybody profit out of that? You know, you don't have to show the receipts, just clarify certain things for the public. Was Magda's ID on her? Was her phone taken away from her? Do we have any information on that? Where were her credit cards? 
at that point. Who paid for Magda's ticket back? Is there paper trail on that? You know, just certain things that then the public might actually start believing you, might actually start believing that there was no foul play here. And that brings me to the end of this case, the conclusions of it, that this case is so, so easily solvable. Just by showing some paper trail or showing it to the family. We don't have to know about it. And then getting that toxicology report from Egypt, getting any sort of footage, any sort of evidence from there. And then we can go from there. If they have either forged documents or can't provide, certain footage has suddenly been deleted, well, then we know why. Then we can easily suspect foul play. And here is where I pass it on to you. What do you think needs to be done here? As I mentioned, I would like some actionable advice, what the family can do legally. There is a petition that I will put in a description box that I think exists since 2017. It is directed at, like, prosecution's office and stuff. I don't know if it is still valid if there is any better way to sort of put pressure on either Egyptian authorities or Polish authorities than in turn put some more pressure for the information to be sent over. And my question, just like with every single mystery where, you know, a lot of people are tending to sway the foul play way, if the Egyptian authorities were to send the tox report today, if they were to send all of the files, like every single thing that they haven't done for five years, would you believe that evidence? Would you believe that it wasn't forged? Would you buy into any explanation as to why it hadn't been sent over for five years? And that resumes my recording session for the day that has already lasted six hours. This is, this is, there are people have done like 10 minutes of this video. How? How do people do this? Because I don't, I don't know how. And I have probably left out so much, probably because of the language barrier, because of everything. I don't know how people do this. So if you like deep dives, going down a rabbit hole with me, please make sure you like this video and you subscribe, expose me to more people. Over. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely shattered <laughs> to bits and pieces and just spat on you. Well, not physically, because you're not, like, right here, right here. You get it, they get it. They know that there's a distance between you. Is there a distance between us? Let's surpass that. Let's break that distance. Okay, shut it. It'd be cool to meet, like, all of these people in public one day. How are you gonna do that? Just call them all to a pub here in London, yeah? Just give out your address. I swear to God, I need to go. Yeah, yeah, you suggest how you should meet in public one day. And let me know your opinions on this case. Let me know some actionable, actionable tips. I shall be seeing you next week. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Don't drop it. Okay. <laughs> ah, bye.